you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. He either, you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ultrasound Podcast. Mike Mallon here. We've got a special treat for you today. This is something super interesting. We're going to turn you into one of the cool kids in the emergency department with this little trick. Uh, I've been uh, looking forward to this for a while. And uh, today, Matt Dawson is going to teach us how to perform a femoral nerve block with ultrasound guidance. All right, so let's start off with a case. I'm pretty sure you probably know how to use this, but I just want to give you an example. So you're working in a rural emergency department. You're getting slammed. Patients everywhere. You're ready to pull your hair out, and then EMS comes in with an 86-year-old who couldn't keep standing upright, had a fall, and she's got an obvious femoral neck fracture. So you're kind of irritated about this, and then you look and realize, oh, that's your grandma. So now you feel really bad for getting angry at her because she's super sweet. I mean, the story was that she was baking cookies for a Girl Scout troop and then tripped over some presents that were laying on her floor that she hadn't had time to take to the orphanage yet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you feel really bad. You want to treat her pain, but you can't really stick around very long. You've got a lot of patients. So you order some morphine. You call the university. The orthodox says, all right, yeah, send her up. She's got a femur fracture. Um, so now you've got a choice to make. You talk with the EMS. They're a little worried about giving her a lot of narcotics on the way because, I mean, especially your grandma looks like she's been eating as many of these cookies as she's been giving away. She's got sleep apnea. She's a big lady. And you know that if they give her a lot of narcotics, she could definitely quit breathing, and you would not want to have the death of your grandmother on you. So what are you going to do? What if what if you could actually treat her pain and not have to sedate her? Would that not be cool? And you could have fun while doing it? That sounds awesome. So I think you know where we're going with this. We're going to teach you how to give her a femoral nerve block. And like Mike said, we're going to kind of turn you into the cool kid in the ER because this is something that... Uh, I mean, I think I think of this as the nursemaid's elbow for the cool guy because you get to treat the pain really quickly, but you're also using some sweet technology and everybody thinks you're a rock star, even though this really isn't a hard procedure. So let's turn you into a rock star. Before we actually show you how to do it, though, let's talk about some of the hangups that you may have for this. I mean, initially you may be thinking, you know what, not another new trick. This is too new. When more people adopt it, then maybe I'll start doing it as well. Well, This is not a new trick. It may be new to you, but it's not new to the emergency department. Here's a study from 1987. That's 24 years, if you're not very good at math, where people were doing femoral nerve blocks for the management of femoral shaft fractures. Now, this wasn't with ultrasound, was it, Matt? This was just... This was not. This this is where you just go interior and feel like three pops, and then you inject the fluid in between the third and the fourth pop, not the fifth pop. And I mean... Exactly. You just stick the needle in. And this is not a super hard procedure with ultrasound, but of course, I mean, ultrasound is going to make this better. Um, So that's the next question. Does ultrasound really make this better? And to be honest, I want to punch myself in the face for even asking because it's pretty obvious that any kind of procedure here where you're sticking a needle in pretty close to someone's vessels and pretty close to a nerve, that's what you're trying to block, you're probably going to be better seeing the needle tip. But I really, uh, really the reason why I have this slide up here is because recently on an EM rap, um, Al Cicati, who does some awesome rants, was teaching us how to do nerve blocks and he mentioned there was a study in Europe that said that ultrasound guidance wasn't really all that better for fascia iliaca block. Now I couldn't find this study um, but while I was looking for it I ran across these 20 to 30 studies showing the ultrasound was better. So I haven't been able to find that study but it seems to me in my review of the literature that ultrasound definitely makes this safer, is more efficacious and just is a lot better. I even actually found one study I remember looking at fascia iliaca blocks, uh, the lidocaine versus normal saline, and there wasn't that much of a difference when they, and they were doing it blindly. So I'm a little curious to see what that, what that study was because um, it just doesn't really hold up in my so to, experience. So to be fair, a lot of these studies that you found are probably not emergency medicine literature, right? They're probably anesthesia, things like that. Is that right? Correct, but I'm not sure exactly that we're going to be better at doing it blind than the anesthesiologists are. So uh, I'm not sure what Maybe we just have is. more experience doing it. Nah. <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly. We do a lot more of these than yeah. anesthesia. So many, so many more of these anesthesia. So, so I guess some of the things that maybe make ultrasound better are uh, you can get it right next to the nerve. So maybe you use less lidocaine or less, less bupivacaine, whatever you're using. Um, you 
we're probably going to hit the artery less, right? Yeah, and and, um, and Al even talked about that, about accidentally getting ABGs. Um, and I don't think you have to do that. I mean, it's probably not going to be a, a huge issue. I mean, you hold some pressure, and they probably do okay. They're not going to bleed out from that. But I would rather not hit the artery if I can. Well, anytime you poke an artery, you run the risk of getting an AV fistula. I mean, you know, we see those patients after a coronary cath, and... I guess, granted, we're using a slightly, we're not using a big dilator, but, you know, you could be using an 18-gauge spinal needle. Okay, you can mess me. So let's not hit the artery. Let's just do it under ultrasound guidance. And, you know, the last kind of study that kind of summarized all, there was a nice best evidence report in the British Medical Journal. They looked at 137 different papers, and their conclusion was, yeah, ultrasound is better like we thought. So, well, uh, you, just, just 137 papers? Exactly, yeah. Right. So, but you're right. Mike, I mean, you were talking about these are mainly studies with anesthesiologists doing it. That's where most of the literature is. Can we do it as emergency physicians? And the answer is, yeah, we've got actually several studies showing that we're pretty good at this. It's not a hard thing to do, too. Dating all the way back to that 1987 study, not ultrasound guidance. That was an emergency medicine study. We've even got one study that's a randomized controlled trial in 2003. So we've got some pretty good studies. We can definitely do this. So, Matt, did you find any studies that talk about how long it takes to do this? Because, you know, I don't want to spend in two years of my education trying to learn how to put in You're a You're really trying to tick me off, aren't you? This is definitely one of my pet peeves. I hear physicians all the time, especially some of the older docs, say, yeah, it's a new trick. I'm an old dog. I can't learn this. Yeah, you did a one-year fellowship. Well, you do not need a one-year fellowship to do this, and I'm not just saying that. There's a really cool study by Christos and Chiampas in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. They, in 20 minutes, gave a didactic session, reviewed anatomy, looked at some images, taught people how to do this in 20 minutes. Then these people learning watched one of these, and then all the physicians were comfortable doing this at their first patient encounter. And that's been my experience. When I teach residents this, they see one, and then they do the next one, and they feel pretty comfortable with it. This is not a difficult procedure to do. So what are the complications? What are the things you got to worry about? I mean, obviously, anytime you're sticking a needle in someone, you're, there's a risk for infection. I would say wash your hands. After that, there's some debate as to how sterile you need to be. You can definitely err on the conservative side and just be totally sterile. Use all the barriers and, and uh, stick a sheath on the probe. I think what most people do and what I tend to do is I try to sterilize the area really well. Um, use sterile gloves on the probe. I will put a tegaderm over the probe to kind of sterilize the probe, keep it clean. And then I don't touch the probe with my needle as well. I've, I've, just, I've prepped a big area. I'm putting the needle in through that prepped area, and I'm watching the needle, but the needle and probe are never really touching each other. So you're coming laterally from the probe. That way you're not right on top of it with the needle. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you can do this in the long or short axis, and we'll show you exactly how to do that in a minute. But um, that's how I do it, at least. I don't know if that's right or wrong or how sterile you have to be. The other thing that people worry about are nerve injury. Um, it turns out not so much, with, especially with ultrasound guidance. We're probably not going to hit the nerve. In this block, at least, you don't even have to get all that close to the nerve. So there's no reason to think you're going to injure the nerve. And, I mean, come on. It, we've been doing these blindly forever. They use nerve stimulators or, or just kind of poking around. You're definitely hitting the nerve. And we don't have reports of a lot of complications, even with the blind technique. So this is really not a concern for me, especially when I'm watching the needle tip the whole time. So Matt, I've got a question for you. So sometimes when I want to perform this procedure, I'll get in touch with my consultants beforehand to find out if they're okay with it. Just because, you know, ultimately I'm going to be admitting this patient to, well, let's face it, medicine, but <laughs> with orthopedics consulting. And I've actually run into some uh, kickback from them before because they apparently like their patients to be in a lot of pain. Um, can you explain to me why that is? So so I, I think you know, we're being a little hard on them. They probably don't like their patients to be in pain, I think probably the more accurate thing is they're afraid they're gonna get yelled at for doing something new. But that's actually the reason why I wanted to talk about this. Okay, so at this point I had a story here that after listening to it, I think, you know, it didn't really have the respectful tone that we were really going for with Ultrasound Podcast. So I th actually think it is important that we keep collegial relationships with our colleagues of other specialties and respect what they do even when we don't necessarily completely agree with them. So instead of the story that I had here, I'm just going to jump straight in and talk about maybe a theoretical issue that someone may bring up and a response to that. So what if someone says to you, well, don't patients who get femoral nerve blocks fall more later? So I found this study, Clinical Orthopedics, uh, 2010. They were looking at complications of 
femoral nerve block for total knee replacements. And there were not any increase in falls, even though this doesn't apply to our patients, these femoral neck fractures. I just wanted to talk about this in case it ever gets brought up. If you just Google complications of of nerve block, you're going to get this paper because in the conclusion, the authors say, hey, maybe you fall more after a nerve block. But if you actually read their paper, they didn't fall more. What their paper actually showed was that the patients who got nerve blocks had less complications than the patients who didn't get nerve blocks. The patients without nerve blocks had more pneumonia because they're getting a lot of narcotics for their pain instead and they're not breathing deeply, more arthrofibrosis. And it's just crazy that uh, someone would use this as a reason not to give a nerve block when it actually showed that you benefited from them. So sorry to spend so much time on that, but it kind of riled me up a little bit when they <laughs> when they did this. All right, Mike's asleep. So let's look at some actual evidence. The British General of Anesthesia has over 2,000 femoral nerve blocks in this study. And they say it's great. It works way better for acute pain management. Uh, there was another study specifically looking at this this question of increasing fall afterwards because you, the nerves kind of out a little longer. And what they found is there was not any increase in the risk of falling. So what about these complications that we talked about, about maybe nerve injury, maybe infection? How often does it actually happen? We're kind of telling you that it doesn't happen all that often, but are there any experience with emergency physicians doing this. If you if you were at ASEP and you saw Mike Stone's incredible nerve block lecture, then you already know this, but uh, Dr. Stone says that they have a registry getting ready to be published. It's not been published yet of their experience of over 100 blocks, more than 25 different providers. So these are not only super users. It's not only ultrasound fellowship trained people. It's interns, residents, PAs, fellows, attendings, and over 100 blocks, they only had two block failures and zero complications. So that's a nice number to remember. I mean, is the complication rate zero from this? No, but this was over 100 blocks and they had none. So we're not bad at this. And remember, it's better too. Even if there were some complications, we could accept those because you get incredible pain relief. You get less side effects from the narcotics, no respiratory depression, no hypotension, the nausea, the issues with narcotic addictions when prescribing maybe patients a ton of narcotics in the, in the hospital for their initial painful injury if we could give them blocks instead and treat their pain without without getting those those addictions that would be a nice benefit as well you know what's interesting is this seems uh, like in my experience this seems pretty standard of care in pediatrics in the in the pediatrics realm it seems like every kid with a femur fracture or a femoral neck fracture like almost instantaneously gets a femoral nerve block maybe it's not ultrasound guided but they they often get the femoral nerve block for pain control yet those are the ones that are probably least likely to have apnea or any of these other terrible side effects from the narcotics but when we get the 80 or 9 year old lady in the emergency department all of a sudden oh it's not cool if you have a block or femoral nerve so it's pretty interesting to me that, that we're not doing this on a more regular basis. And obviously, in, in my opinion at least, based on the literature that you've you've shown me, ultrasound makes a lot more sense than doing this blind. Yeah, and it, where I work uh, blocking a femoral nerve for PDH patients is definitely not the standard right now. I mean, it definitely should be. I think it's a lot better. But, um, yeah, even in the pediatric patients, it, we're not doing this enough. We're not doing enough in, in anyone. So let's show you how to do it. Um, in order to help you remember how to do it, I've developed this. I want to think of how could people really remember the steps of this. And I think the easiest way is to remember the nine P's. Pre-scan, plan, prep, poke, penetrate, position, push, pull, and pray. That's a great so, idea, man, Matt. Nine P's. Yeah, the nine Excellent. P's. Excellent. Yeah, I can really remember that well. <laughs> Obviously, we're being facetious here. This is a procedure that is not hard. Like I said, a quick training and watching someone do it, this just makes sense. So you're looking around. You look to see where the femoral nerve is. It's going to be just lateral to the femoral artery. That's I think everybody knows that. They've got a mnemonic, navel or something like that to remember. Uh, nerve, artery, vein, empty, lymphatic. So nerve is the most lateral. Uh, after you've pre-scanned, see where you're going to go. Maybe you're going to mark it at the same time, uh, just so you know you're doing your planning. Then you're going to prep the area. Use some uh, chlorhexidine wipes or, or whatever you're going to use to prep the area really well. Then you're going to prep the pro, put your gloves on, do all that stuff that you would do, obviously, for this procedure. Then you're going to insert the needle in long axis, as you can see here. You're lining the needle up perfectly. With the transducer, you're having the machine on the opposite side of the bed so that, you're not, so that you have a nice line of view and you're just looking up and down, up and down from the needle to the machine. You're slowly inserting the needle. You're watching the tip the whole time. That's the most important point of this. 
you never want to lose sight of that tip. If you see that the whole time and you see the nerve and artery, you're not going to have a complication from sticking something you don't want to. You're going to slow down. You're going to pop through the fascia lata, this first fascial plane, and then the fascia iliaca. Now, this is how that the blind uh, procedure is taught. You're going to feel those pops. But you can actually feel it and watch those pops when you're doing under, under ultrasound guidance. Once you get under this layer, the fascia iliaca, then you're just going to inject the lidocaine. And the great thing about this block is once you're under that layer, you don't have to be all that close to the nerve. I mean, the closer you get to the nerve, the less actual medication you're going to have to use. So that's an important consideration. But if you're in that space, the medication is going to get to the nerve. So how much actual medication do you use? Well, this has been taught if you read how to do this, especially with the blind technique, people talk about 30 cc's, 20 to 30 cc's, because you're just getting in that space and you're just making sure there's enough there that it goes around the nerve. I don't usually use that much, though. I mean, I'm putting the needle a little closer to the nerve, and 10 to 15 really works for me. If you want to be a little more safe and stay away from the nerve and just get under that fascia iliaca, you could definitely dilute your medication, add some saline, and go ahead and give them 20 to 30 cc's. That's fine to do. I, I just prefer to work with that smaller syringe. I'm also using a normal needle. This is traditionally taught to use a blunt needle. And the main reason people teach that is so you don't injure the nerve. But guess what? I'm not going to touch the nerve. So it really doesn't matter. There's no evidence that a blunt needle is needed. You can do this with just your standard stuff in the emergency department. Grab a normal needle, 22 gauge, even 25 gauge would be fine. Put it on the end of a 10 cc syringe. A spinal even. needle, right? So you can use a spinal needle. That's going to be longer. That's going to be a little easier. You can be nice and shallow and still get to where you want to go. I use a normal needle a lot of the times. I don't have any problems. If the patient is a really big patient, then a spinal needle is going to be more important. But I just will grab the standard stuff frequently, and I don't have a problem getting this block. It works really well. When you're, when you're pushing the medication, you're going to want to see, as you can see on the video here, the medication spread over the nerve. It's usually going to go over the nerve underneath that fascia iliaca. Sometimes it's going to dissect the nerve off of the iliopsoas muscle, which is kind of sitting on. But you don't have to get that donut sign to know that you've got a good block. As long as it's kind of going over the nerve, it's going to work. Now, Matt, do you ever use this idea of uh, dissection with normal saline? So as you're, as you're sticking the needle in, you actually uh, initially connect the needle to, you know, just like 10 cc's of normal saline and kind of as you're pushing the needle down, inject a little bit of saline to help you visualize where your needle is and, and how deep you're going and then to sort of move the tissue around. Yeah, so you're talking about hydrolocalization. You can definitely Ooh, do that. Ooh, hydrolocalization. You, <laughs> that's awesome. And that's a nice technique to use if you get, can't really see your needle very well, very well. You want to know where the tip is and you want to know if you're under which fascial plane you're under. If you're going lateral and keeping your pro, p keeping your needle pretty flat, a very shallow angle, you're going to see that needle. It's not that hard. You have trouble seeing your needle when you have really kind of deep angles, uh, sharp angles. But if you're pretty shallow, I don't. I find that I don't really need to do that. I can see as soon as that needle has popped under the fascia iliaca, and I'm just watching it the whole time. But that is a nice technique. If you lose your needle tip, you could inject a tiny bit and see where you are. So hopefully you feel comfortable with this having seen it now you've actually got some didactics and you've seen one done as we showed you on the video uh, and like I said this is one of my favorite procedures I think a lot of the ultrasound stuff that we teach um, it's obvious to us that it makes a difference like in diagnostics with an undifferentiated hypotensive patient or abdominal pain but we have trouble really kind of proving to ourselves that this is really making a difference for the patient. I mean, I always have the thought, well, would I figure that out without the ultrasound machine? And I can't say for sure. But what I love about this procedure is that, you know, every time I do this, when I have a patient that their pain is 12 out of 10, I do this, and then they're 0 out of 10, I know I've made a difference, that this is better than giving them some pain medication to get them down to a 4. I just know it's better. And when we really get, kind of get down to the core of why we practice medicine and what our goal is, it's I think it's to relieve suffering and increase the quality of life for people and this is something that I know does that pretty much 100% of the time so I'm, I was really excited to talk about this and um, I really think this is something that makes a difference in medicine I couldn't agree with you more, Matt. This is a, a great uh, a great application of ultrasound, and you can really see the difference that you're making almost instantly with patients. So I'm, I'm stoked to use it some more in the emergency department, and uh, with this literature, maybe we can fight the battle to do it more often. Yep, go relieve some suffering.
you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasounds, hearts, lungs, my VCs, let us know how you feel about it.